Today's show is sponsored by Spot from NetApp, the cloud automation platform that makes it easy to deliver continuously optimized infrastructure at the lowest possible cost. Spot helps customers get the most out of their cloud investments by automating cloud infrastructure to ensure performance, reduce complexity, and optimize cost. Their machine learning and automation scale to exactly meet application needs using the most efficient mix of instances and pricing models, eliminating the risks of over-provisioning and cloud waste. Best of all, their software works with leading cloud platforms, services, and tools so that you can simplify and automate your cloud infrastructure wherever your workloads and applications run and however you run them. Discover how leading companies from cloud native startups to global enterprises are automating, simplifying, and optimizing their cloud infrastructure with Spot by NetApp. Check them out at spot.io slash cloudcast, where you can find more information, quest a demo, or even start a free trial. That's spot.io slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hope everybody's doing well as we continue into August of 2021. I mean, hard to believe that we are already uh, kind of halfway through the summer into the into the eighth month of the year. And uh, hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's staying safe. Uh, I know the, the COVID's still rampaging throughout the world and uh, hope everybody's taking care of themselves. Let's dive right into the cloud news of the week. This is the uh, week of the quarter that uh, is earnings week for the big three clouds. So let's dive right into those numbers. The numbers were... Uh, all strong. Um, let's jump right into it. Uh, AWS up 37% now at a $59 billion run rate for AWS's business. So they did about $14 billion this quarter, again, up 37%. And uh, it'll be sort of interesting to mark this uh, sort of the last quarter that Andy Jassy was in charge of AWS. And now um, Mr. Solipsky will be in charge. We'll have to sort of see how well uh, AWS continues to uh, to execute uh, Microsoft next uh, in their announcement again, uh, as we mention every time, Microsoft is the one cloud that does not yet break out the Azure specific earnings. They uh, lump them into Intelligent Cloud, which also includes Windows Server, SQL Server, GitHub, uh, a few of the other properties. Uh, they came in at fifty one percent year over year. Uh, now there was some speculation that um, with uh, when you adjust for currency and in, in some of the inflations around currency exchange, uh, that number was closer to like 45, 46% uh, year over year growth, but uh, still uh, up quite a bit for Azure. And the that intelligent cloud group is now up to a $69 billion run rate. So again, uh, can't extrapolate that exactly as Azure revenue. Uh, obviously, it includes some on-prem stuff and some software licensing, but uh, again, uh, continuing business, uh, the Azure business continues to grow up 51%. And then finally, Google's earnings were up 54%, uh, run around a $18.5 billion run right now for Google Cloud. So uh, still third place, uh, still considerably behind the first two, but uh, continuing to grow. And uh, one thing that was noted in the uh, earnings for Google Cloud this year uh, or this quarter, uh, they continue to uh, get closer to profitability. Still not a profitable group yet, but uh, getting closer and closer to profitability. So instead of uh, losing the billions, they're now losing in the hundreds of millions. So um, anyways, uh, one last thing that was there regarding the the big three sort of cloud numbers that we throw out all the time, the uh, Google Magic Quadrant is back, uh, makes an appearance again. Uh, and uh, as it was the year before and the year before that and the number of years before that, uh, the top three are still AWS, Azure, and Google. Uh, Tencent did make a uh, appearance. So we went from uh, seven or six clouds to seven. Ten cent made an appearance along with uh, Oracle Cloud, IBM Cloud, and Alibaba as well, rounding out the top seven. So, um, you know, we'll put the link in the show notes. A uh, number of sort of interesting comments and perspectives uh, as the clouds evolve uh, from Gartner. Uh, Lydia Leong and her team do a really, really good job of of going through that. So, worth taking a read. So, uh, you know, for another quarter, uh, the clouds continue to grow. If you are Competing against those three clouds, uh, your life continues to be challenging um, as, uh, you know, they continue to grow, they continue to amass more applications and data. If you are a customer of those, it seems like you continue to uh, to spend and spend uh, very heartily uh, with the cloud providers. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't expect that to slow down anytime soon, although we have, you know, obviously pointed out, you know, we're going through some transitions within all the cloud. So always opportunities for uh, the market to change, to evolve. And as new applications and new trends, uh, we'll definitely keep you uh, ahead of the loop on that. 
So with this, we're going to wrap up Cloud News of the Week. We have a very interesting conversation this week, uh, really looking at application modernization, uh, application transformation, so not necessarily building new applications, which we do talk about quite a bit, but really looking at how do we modernize existing applications, and we will get to that right after the break. Today's show is brought to you by CBT Nuggets. You know how much we value ongoing education on the Cloudcast, and CBT Nuggets is exactly what Aaron and I wish we had when we were trying to get our certification early in our careers. CBT Nuggets is all about bringing a personalized touch to learning about cloud computing, virtualization, networking, DevOps, and much, much more. Whether it's their hands-on labs with personalized coaching or the online chat functions that come up with every instructor-led course, CBT Nuggets' team of experts is always there to help you get the most from your training and your PASA certification. You can check it all out at cbtnuggets.com slash cloudcast and sign up for a free trial. You get access to the full catalog of great training, including virtual labs, quizzes, and other premium features completely free for the first seven days. That's cbtnuggets.com slash cloudcast. And we're back. And folks, you know, as you know, one of the one of the big buzzwords in our industry is people like to talk about digital transformation. We love to talk about innovation and change. But the reality is, you know, for most companies, maybe about 20% of what they're able to spend their time and their money and their budget and their people and their cycles on is, you know, completely new greenfield stuff. And so a lot of what they have to spend their time on is, you know, figuring out how to look at their existing portfolio of applications, the things that run the business day to day, and how much time do they spend modernizing them? How much time do they spend replatforming them and, and all the other f- sort of five R's that uh, Gartner likes to talk about? And so I thought we'd talk about today a little bit about application modernization, what it means, what sort of tooling is out there to help, and what are some of the trends that are, that are driving this. So excited to bring on a colleague of mine, good friend of mine, somebody who I've been watching them work on this application modernization thing for quite a while. So James Labaki, Senior Director of Product Management at Red Hat. Welcome to the show. Great to have you on, James. Hey, thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. Um, so we're going to dive into, you have been leading this community for the last I want to say at least 18 months or so, um, but you've been around this space for a while, a um, community called Conveyor. Before we dive into Conveyor and, and kind of the, the breadth of what that is, give us a little bit of your background, um, kind of what, what's gotten you interested in this whole space of, of modernizing stuff, uh, migrating and modernizing stuff. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So I think, you know, I've been been at, uh, actually been at Red Hat now for uh, roughly 11 years. Before that, I was at a, a number of startups and both large uh, organizations and startups as well, um, um, kind of a Linux and open source engineering. So come from that sort of background. And, um, you know, even when I first started at Red Hat, just seeing the struggle of people trying to modernize their apps, it's always been a struggle. Uh, you know, it's great that we can... Um, you know, invent new technologies and new innovations, but if we can't get applications to actually run on those platforms and leverage those innovations, it becomes pretty difficult. So right. I think that one of the biggest needs I see out in the landscape right now, even if you look across like the CNCF landscape is uh, there's a lot of great technology there, but it's very difficult for people to uh, to, to adopt those technologies and, and modernize their apps that exist to use them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I know you and I get a chance to, to talk to a lot of companies, you probably even more so uh, than me. Give us some sense of, you know, as you're talking to, to organizations um, and, and you kind of get brought in to talk about whether it's modernization or migration or just how to rationalize it, like what's what's some of the ways that, that companies think about it? What's some of the drivers that, that motivate them to say, hey, you know, we're going to commit to doing something. What are some of the roadblocks? Like kind of give folks a big picture of, you know, what that, that sort of thought process goes, you know, looks like and, and goes through people's head. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I would say there's often uh, quite a big disconnect from, uh, you know, I would say senior leaders and then the practitioners underneath them about what's going to be required to actually modernize. So um, I, there's a vast array of, of uh, meetings and, and, uh, and, and discussions I have with folks from various roles um, from IT decision makers down to you know developers and, and SREs, and I think uh, no two journeys are the same inside of most organizations. It right. depends on how they're organized, what their goals are. Um, some companies will see just kind of start with let's let's do a pr- let's do a proof and a pilot on a small uh, application archetype. Other ones will go ahead and you know say hey we're going to dedicate several hundred million dollars towards modernizing our application portfolio and have a top down approach. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think necessarily one or the other is, is wrong or right, um, depending on the company, but really, um, I think at the heart of it, 
um, what, what we found is that there is kind of a, a lack of broadly transferable skills around the various both methodologies and tools that people can use uh, to both assess, analyze, and then execute um, any of those you know, six R's uh, you know, that you, you, you'd want to do to modernize your application. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's hard for, I feel like it's hard for a number of reasons. I think part of it is, um, you know, in, in many cases, by the time a company says, Hey, you know, we need to modernize something. Uh, number one, it's fairly well entrenched. So they're, they're a little worried about it falling down. Um, that technology, you know, those people that made that decision, those developers that built that code may not be there. Um, you know, so they oftentimes, you know, find themselves in a situation where it's like this weird dichotomy of like, well, the thing runs, uh, it it makes money for us, it supports something that's important, but to a certain extent, they've treated it like that thing that you put in the back of your closet and it collects dust and you sort of forget yeah. about it. And it is it is that weird trade off of like, you know, I don't even know that I want to modernize the whole thing. Maybe I only want to modernize a part of it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, like you said, the journeys are always different. And it's always a strange starting point as to where they come from. Yeah. And oftentimes it's not just even about like the code, right? It's also all, everything surrounding the code and the processes and everything that's happening that end up uh, judging whether or not it's a good, you know, candidate to be, uh, let's say, run in a container versus, you know, in a, in a virtual machine. And, and so those, I think those aspects really is where you start to get into uh, the, the nuances. Uh, right, the, the right. Journey. Well, and I think the other thing, uh, and one more thing, just before we jump into some of the conveyor stuff, I think the other thing is, you know, I find a lot of executives get brought in, they're brought in to do, you know, modernize activities, you know, digital transformation. And they're, they're super excited about the part that's built something new. Everybody's fascinated with the build something new part. And, and they're a little afraid of being like, do I want to take the fall? Do I want to be the scapegoat? Do I want to take the problems of fixing this old stuff? And, and I guess some people are good at it, but it's, it is, you know, especially with people staying uh, in jobs shorter and shorter, um, it is, it is an interesting conversation as to, you know, whether or not they're like, uh, do I want to be the person who made that thing fall down? Does it, you know, I, I think, I think to your point, it's hard for them to, to rationalize a number of, you know, what value does this create if I'm modernizing yeah, yeah. something that to me, that that's what it always boils down to is like, can you create some sort of value? Cause that becomes a motivator to go, yes, we should look yeah. at this new technology. Somebody should put their career on the line, whatever it might be. Yeah, we, we just had, um, uh, you know, just was hearing about an aerospace company that had uh, kind of a black box of code that they no longer, you know, the developers were long gone, but it was extremely valuable to them. And they wanted to actually apply learning models to it and, uh, you know, and start to do some, some machine learning around it and, and modeling. And, uh, you know, they, they have this nice GitOps flow with their machine learning. It was like, okay, now how do I bring this into that environment so I can get that benefit? So I think we're going to see a lot of that where there's, you know, the things I don't want to touch necessarily, but I need to bring them in and make them, you know, uh, available to my new GitOps workflows so that I can uh, expose them to new cloud services and, and, and drive that value. Yeah. And, and especially those things that are very data intensive, I think uh, people can tend to yeah. find value in data. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, you've been working on this, um, you know, what started as, a, as an open source community, uh, one project, it's grown into a lot of projects. Tell us a little bit about Conveyor um, kind of conceptually and then kind of where it's, how it's evolved over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. So the Conveyor community, um, you can find it at uh, conveyor.io um, is essentially what happened was when we started down this journey of looking at the app modernization space, um, Red Hat's had a long history of, of having a bunch of open source tools and things of that nature at all levels of the stack and have always, you know, in, in our nature has always been open sourcing any of our, our technology around these areas. But we didn't really have a community, I would say, around them. Um, we had a lot of projects, but we didn't have kind of vibrant communities. So as we started to look at the app modernization space be, and really becoming more important to the success of people moving to, towards a hybrid cloud, um, we, we started to say like, okay, what, what do we want to do if we were pulled together a community for this? And, and all the practitioners we would meet with, developers, SREs and, and others, um, when we would meet with them, what we found was, A, they didn't want to hear about digital transformation. Yeah. <laughs> B, B, they didn't want to hear about, uh, you know, your your uh, framework for modernization, right? Because, like, nobody else uses that, right? And every system integrator has a different one and partner has a different one, vendor has a different one. Um, so they didn't want to hear about that. But what and, and but what they did want to hear, and, and they didn't want to see your proprietary tools for doing this either because right. they didn't feel like spending money. But what they did love was, hey, here's how I broke down my monolith. You know, here's how I strangled it and, you know, 
pulled off one of the services and, and are running it on, you know, or here's how I leverage a sidecar container or here's how I modernize this Java app, right? And so when we get down to those topics, it was very valuable. Um, and then what we heard was, you know, people wanted more tools uh, that were open that they could build into their environments um, because every customer and every system integrator is gonna have their tool set for modernization and a different way of doing it. But if we can get them a, some sort of base tooling that covers you know, 60% of it, um, that they could then integrate into their environments, it takes a lot of the work off an investment that they need to do. And it, it kind of becomes the uh, benefit of the open source development model where you know, it's a rising tide for, for all, the, all, the, all the folks involved. Right. Um, yeah. So that's what we did. Yeah. And I think, I think the thing you really highlighted, which, which I've heard over and over again, is a, a lot of times, you know, especially the, the systems integration companies, the companies who oftentimes get pulled in to, to take on these big transformation challenges, because again, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if I want to own it, but somebody else can own it. They, they bring a ton of expertise. They bring a bunch of tools, but oftentimes they look at that as intellectual property and they don't necessarily want to want to give it away because that's the thing that, yeah. that drives it. So the, the thing about, you know, the first thing that jumped out at me about conveyor was just kind of flipping the script on, on that thing of, um, like you said, uh, that has a place, but when you go and, and talk to actual practitioners and users, they're oftentimes like, yeah, but that's not what I want. Right. Like, or that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't fit exactly. And, um, yeah, Let's let's kind of dive into it a little bit. The the project is uh, like many things around the Kubernetes community begins with a K, so it's conveyor uh, with a K. Um, now there's a whole bunch of of uh, sort of sub projects underneath it. Walk us through, you know, at least at a high level, kind of the five or six things that that you've been working on and, and kind of why they're you know organized the way they are. Yeah, yeah. And let's see if I could do this from memory. I don't have them in front of me, so um, so we have um, so the projects. Uh, Again, so, our, so I've, got, um, I've got them in front of me. If you want me to, to no, no, to you. okay, <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so, so you know, one of the so if you kind of break it down around the six or the, the six R's, there's really three of them. I would say we focus on rehosting, refactoring, um, and replatforming. So, in the rehosting space, um, you know, two areas that we saw that were pretty interesting. One was um, actually uh, lifting and shifting virtual machines and rehosting them into technologies like Kubevert. So, Kubevert is um, the technology that allows you to run virtual machines side by side with containers orchestrated by Kubernetes. And so um, what, what Forklift allows you to do uh, is actually rehost virtual machines uh, from traditional virtualization into uh, Kubernetes-based virtualization with Kubert. Um, so it'll do warm migration, it'll discover your virtual machines, um, and it's kind of, you know, deploys, you can deploy it as an operator you, uh, or in other formats and kind of migrate your machines. So that was the first kind of rehosting use case that we saw. The the other one was that we had a number of users that had already containerized their apps on Kubernetes, but they wanted to move to a different Kubernetes cluster. So, you know, maybe I'm moving from one version of Kubernetes to another. And that, that was, we found that they were having uh, challenges with that. So we actually uh, have the Crane project. That one's not with a K, that one's with a C. Um, and that helps you <clears throat> migrate your persistent data and objects from one Kubernetes cluster to another. Um, and the, the Crane project's actually looking at extending a little bit right now because one of the big challenges we saw with people moving from one Kubernetes cluster to another is that we found that most of the apps running on the existing Kubernetes cluster, maybe 20% of them were done in like a, a really nice, yeah, great automation, great application lifecycle management properly built. Oftentimes the other 80% had some, you know, struggles with automation. We'll just to put it nicely. And yeah. so our goal with the next version of Crane is actually to allow people to kind of hammer their existing containerized apps on Kubernetes into and kind of import them and hammer them into a new GitOps workflow uh, that maybe they're defining um, on their new cluster. So it's more about like cleaning up your automation and getting your apps into that flow. So those are kind of two that were really around rehosting. Um, uh, then we have um, a project called Move to Cube. This was actually open sourced by the IBM research team. They were working with customers that were migrating from Cloud Foundry and Docker Swarm to Kubernetes. And so they have built some uh, some tooling that actually helps uh, with transformations. So, for example, if you don't have the concept of, of ingress, you know, uh, routes on, on your Kubernetes cluster, um, it will discover that and it will help you create that, you know, actually construct the code to create those things and interrogate you as it's moving it. And then you could integrate that into your um, pipelines. Um, the, the fourth project... Um, is actually called Tackle. Um, and so Tackle is actually about assessing and analyzing your applications for container, containerization. So there's a human element to this where we have 
like a, a common application inventory where you can add your application. You could obviously import via CSV and some other methods to an API, but you can build your application inventory and then you could actually uh, answer questions about it. But then there's an, an analysis piece where we actually can do static code analysis and decompilation of um, uh, Java application archives specifically, and then look inside and see their dependencies and libraries and start to sh show you risks that you might encounter. Like, you know, if you have um, static IP addresses or local file systems, things that will keep you from moving towards uh, Kubernetes. And then, um, so that's the Tackle project. And the last one is Polaris. So Polaris was um, developed out of our, um, our our services organization, actually at Red Hat, to measure um, for software delivery performance. So if you're familiar with the, the Dora metrics um, and you know uh, lead time for change and code deployment frequency and those sorts of things, and so Polaris is actually sits will get deployed and, and tie into uh, your you know whether it's Jira or GitLab and all these tools that you have running, and it will start to measure those for you and produce a dashboard so you can see if you're actually improving. And we thought it was kind of important to encapsulate that in the conveyor community, because we don't just want to modernize your apps for the sake of modernization. Along the way, we want to see, are we actually improving? So hopefully that gives you a good idea of the kind of the lay of the land with the projects. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a good layout. It's it, like you said, it's um, it, first and foremost, it sort of maps to, you know, some of the more common sort of ours, rehost, replatform, refactor, uh, but the other thing I really like about kind of the, the the way that you guys think about this is it's not just a, um, you know, here's a tool, run the tool, uh, new state, right? It's it, it kind of, it'll do inventory, it'll go off and do evaluation, because in a lot of cases, um, you know, and, and you and I have even seen this with, with some companies themselves, like they'll do their own uh, assessment of what it is. And they might say, well, we went into this thinking we had to, you know, update 70% of them. And we come back and it's like, oh, there's really only about 23 that are, you know, low hanging fruit would fit into our budget. Like you've got to kind of be able to have stages where you can say, maybe these were our initial goals. We went and looked in the closet blew the dust off mm -hmm. things. Okay. It looks like this. Um, and then, like you said, uh, you know, you not only want to be able to, um, kind of work your way through those R's, but then you also want to be able to measure them as you're going along. So it's nice to see kind of the mix of them. And I'm, I'm sure as more people jump into the community, you're going to see, you know, more and more things that people go, Hey, this was useful. That was useful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, I mean, you know, I always say be, beware, the, beware the demo with the magic uh, containerization of your application happens right in the demo. Um, it's, right. it's, it's definitely um, there. I think there's a lot of tools that can help accelerate. But at the end of the day, particularly with refactoring, uh, you know, there's no real silver bullet. It's really about making your assessment and analysis uh, easier and identifying risks that could prohibit you from doing things and then um, making good decisions about whether or not to move forward or not. And then if moving forward, the best way to mitigate those risks. Right. Yeah. Cause like, you, you know, as I'm sure you know, and you highlighted it a little bit, like it's very rare that you have, you know, an application, you know, you're, it's very rare you're dealing with a stateless application. You're typically dealing with multi-layer applications. You've got data dependencies, you've got other dependencies. You want to sort of know, you know, where all the sharp edges are and, and those different things. Um, yep. You know, as you as you look at those, um, obviously, I'm sure this is written down somewhere. You guys do a really good job of of keeping track of this all on Git uh, on Git uh, on GitHub. Excuse me. Um, what are some of the the kind of big picture new things that you're working on, or you know, kind of if there was a roadmap, what are kind of the you know the pillars of of what you're trying to evolve it with? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think. Um, like most open source communities, our, our roadmap is is pretty fluid and we try not to plan out too far ahead. But mm -hmm. I, I will say when you look at this space, I think a lot of times um, we think of app modernization as a, a one-time activity. Right. I think that as things move and are in a GitOps workflow, everything's declarative, you know, you can push changes to the platform automatically. Um, I think that app modernization can actually start to become um, kind of more of just an ongoing thing where as new technologies are available that could optimize you further, like takes like serverless as an example, this could be something that we could potentially actually just have an ongoing inventory of applications where we understand them and can, uh, you know, apply new uh, optimizations and, and value to them um, through that. So long term, I think that's a very interesting thing to uh, look at. Um, short term, you know, we're, we're really focused on just the, the needs of the community and the very specific enhancements people are asking for, for the tools. We're trying not to get too ahead of our skis and 
try and integrate everything together. But um, there's some things like if you look at forklift connecting to uh, virtualization and being able to see the application binaries by introspecting virtual machines, well, that could be very interesting if you were able to take that data and move it over to the Tackle project, because now I can take those you know, application binaries and potentially decompile them and start to look at that. So I think some of the integrations between the tools are, uh, are of interest. Um, and then um, we've been working very closely with the IBM research team, who who's, has such a wealth around app modernization, as you know, and they've been uh, really great about open sourcing more and more of their tools. And so I'm really excited to see uh, more uh, you know, open source code being not only just put into the community, but really starting to integrate with uh, like the Tackle project specifically. There's four or five projects right now, some of them that are going to be using um, natural language processing, helping with testing automation that I think could be valuable to uh, many system integrators and and end users. So. Yeah, I, I know. Um, you know, as, as you and I have talked about this sort of offline, uh, you know, the community is more than just you know, kind of the Red Hat folks or vendor side folks. You, you've seen a number of companies um, like jump in because, like you said, they they see value in it. What are some of the lessons you've you've learned from from working with you know some of the practitioners, whether it's things they're contributing, just feedback they've given you about, um, you know, how they're, you know, how they're thinking about some stuff like what, how, how does that other side of the community um, start to come together if you, is, is what you've seen? Yeah. So I think one of the biggest lessons, um, you know, and, and this is, this might strike some people as ironic um, being that, uh, you know, I'm a red hatter for the last 11 years is that, is that community is still very hard and it is still very much an art. And so I think being one of the biggest lessons we learned was being, purposeful. Um, just having open source code does not make a community. And so um, being intentional and purposeful about designing the community in a way, um, we spent quite a bit of time uh, getting a contributor ladder up, a governance model in place now, um, just things that are going to make people feel comfortable if they want to send in a pull request that there's it's going to get reviewed in a timely manner. It's not, you know, they have a voice. Those sorts of things, I think, um, were, uh, you know, lessons, maybe not that we learned, but that we were um, reinforced, I would say, over the last year uh, to really think about that first. Um, and I, we're starting to see, uh, you know, the fruits of the, those labors uh, start to show now where we're getting more and more people asking on our Slack channel and other things around, you know, how does this, they're picking up the tools, they're using them, they're asking questions. And we're hoping that those people that are users start to become contributors over time. So um, I'd say that's, that's the main thing. Um, I think we've, outside of that, I think, um, each project has its own learnings for sure. Um, sure. I mentioned with the Crane project kind of, you know, solving the initial problem of migrating apps between Kubernetes clusters, now realizing that maybe automating those application deployments in the process of migrating is really the key problem to solve. So. Yeah, no, that's that's good stuff. You mentioned you mentioned governance. Governance, governance always super important with projects. Has there been any push by anybody to say, hey, uh, you know, one or some of these should be over in the CNCF just to help them with visibility or, or other things? Or is this still something that like, you know, so, uh, you know, a, a governance like CNCF doesn't necessarily improve what, you, what you're able to do? Yeah, no, I think um, we're definitely, so we've, we've talked to the uh, SIG app delivery group on, in, in the CNCF. Um, and I think we're, that's definitely a goal of ours is to apply for a sandbox project. We don't have a, a concrete timeline. There's a few things we're working on in the build infrastructure um, to make sure that we don't have any dependencies on anything but Kubernetes and upstream CNCF projects. Um, so we're working through some of those details now, and we're hoping that by doing that, plus keeping things open and, and encouraging um, external contributors, our, our meetups have had, um, you know, we've had presentations from a number of partners, system integrators, uh, uh, VMware has presented on some of their, their open source tools as well. So we're certainly open to the collaboration, and I think being part of the CNCF would be extremely helpful in the future. Yeah. One last question before I let you go. Um, you know, we, we've talked about the community um, and we'll put some of these things in the show notes, but what are some of the ways that that people are uh, interacting with the community? What's the, you know, is there, obviously you mentioned there's a, there's a Slack channel. Is there regular meetings? Like how do people tend to interact around the community? Yeah, great question. So we have, um, so Pound Conveyor on Kubernetes Slack is the place where we all hang out and talk. Um, and debate. Uh, the um, if you have a if you if you're we run regular meetups. So like once every two weeks, usually we have a meetup where someone's presenting. Um, the rules are pretty simple. It's like make sure you're demoing something, hopefully, and not just giving slides. Uh, no proprietary technology. No marketing. Kind of keep it. Um, it doesn't have to use any of our tools that are in the community. But just if you want to share your experience on modernizing apps, um, that's the place to do it. 
uh, we'll send you we'll send you an awesome purple conveyor T-shirt um, if you if you speak, and then um, if you just go to Conveyor IO and put your name in the in the little box that pops up in there, you'll get invites to those meetups as well as um, uh, you'll get invited to our planning sessions, which happen quarterly. If you are interested in actually getting more into the you know development side and looking at how you can influence those projects. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. We will uh, we'll put those some of those things in the show notes so in case uh, folks forget them or they're listening. Um, but uh, yeah, James, this was this has been great. I you know I've been uh, folks may go, hey, you know you, you pulled a couple of Red Hat folks. Are you going to turn this into a Red Hat podcast? Uh, you know there are tons and tons of ways for folks to, to listen to Red Hat folks if you're interested. Uh, our friend Chris Short does an awesome thing literally every day on OpenShift TV. But I I did want to pull a couple of things that I found were really very, very broad in scope. And I think conveyor is, is one of those things. Um, you know, there's, like you said, there's been both lots of people sharing experiences and, and tools and so forth, but there's also, you know, from time to time, there's experiences of, you know, some company going, Hey, we've migrated 3000 applications. And you're like, Holy cow, that's, that's amazing. I want to dig into that some more. So lots of really good stuff. Congratulations to, to you and the, the team for, for building the community and, and letting the community grow. So, um, at that, I'm going to kind of wrap up. Uh, I want to thank James so much for uh, for his time today, for his insight. And uh, like I mentioned, we'll put a bunch of things in the show notes so you can go dig into this if uh, this is a topic that's uh, interesting to you. And I know a lot of you are uh, very, very interested. Uh, either this is part of your charter or part of uh, what you're what you're looking to work on. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks to everybody who listens to the show. Thanks for helping us grow the community. Thanks for giving us feedback in all the ways you uh, you get the podcast. And with that, we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 